Which one do you want to go through first? Question one. Three, five, three, five. Okay, so question one, hands. But if you want to see question one covered in today's class, okay, so that was the cyclone, maybe ish. Two. Two. Okay. Question three. Yep. <laughs> Four. Okay, so we can skim that and then find the yeah. centrifuge. Okay. Yeah, right. right. okay, so we'll do three, five, and then one and skim, skim four. So, if you have the midterm there in front of you, uh, if you don't, let's take a look at it here. Okay, so here it is, up here. Let's take a look at, you read it through an exam and your heart is beating, you all stress and you're like, where do I start? Okay, this is standard, right? We all have these, we have this during exams and tests. Does the solution go online? Nope. I will give an uh, answer, but not I don't have any solutions for you. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. What is the thing we're trying to solve? The volume of filtrate being the press, which is the second example. Okay. And we can use. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so the volume of filtrate. Sorry? What's the problem? Okay, let's. Uh, Take a look at the procedure for solving, the problem solving strategy that we've been using through this course. Define. Okay, so define. Our aim is to find this volume V. Okay? What do we know? What do we don't know? What do we so we've got the next step, explore? Explore is where, where are we going to draw our knowledge from? Well, this is really from the filtration section of the course notes. So that's um, uh, the explore step for these courses tends to be very quickly. I've uh, done It's constant pressure filtration. So that's the, the mode we're dealing in. So constant. What do we know? What do we don't know? What is there in this problem as well? There's two, two phases, it seems, right? As, as most of you picked up. We don't know cake resistance. Okay, so unknowns. Cake resistance, RC. Anything else we don't know? Uh, the properties of the slurry, so like density, uh, stopping, um, kind of uh, concentration. Okay, yeah. slurry properties, so a particular row, new. What's the, sh the shape of the, um, of the particles? Okay. Lots of unknowns. What do we know here is given numerically, so that we don't need to list that right now, but what is happening here in this process, What in this question? What is the principle of it? What, what's happened? There's two phases. What's different between phase one and phase two? The first paragraph, second paragraph. One's like at a lab scale, and the other one's like in your plant. Okay. Or in some sort of like pilot size. Lab scale in the first part, and the second part at your plant. Okay. So in the example we did in the courses, in the, in the notes as well, there was the lab system, and I showed you a little picture of the lab at the top. <coughs> And then we looked at taking that same data and we applied it to the plate and frame filter press at the industrial scale. This is, and then we've, we've spoken about how this is the only way we can really determine those cake resistances and medium resistances is by doing lab scale experiments. We, this, the theory only takes us so far and is inaccurate. So the only way we can do these uh, work and get useful values is to go and do an experiment first and then apply it online. Um, why is RM not in the Okay, RM. Okay. So paragraph one is referring to the lab, and in fact it's emphasized there 
with it in two ways. Slurry of filtrate is to be tested, and the set, the last sentence, this is all the information your lab tech gave you. So you've gone, you've given the lab tech sample, and she or he has gone and done the work and given you that information back. So the information that we know there, let's take a look at the knowns. Is we know delta P. Thousand, we know a, a L or A lab uh, is 0 0.05 meters squared. We have the thickness of the cake is 30 millimeters. And what else has the lab tech given us? Volume. Oh, the volume of 0.5 meters. And time. And time that that filtration occurred was 10 minutes. So T equals 10 times 60 seconds, so 600 seconds. Is that? Essentially you can find like a flow rate with that. Okay, let's, yeah, we're going to plan next. Oh, is that, is that you, or is that for just the lab? Or is that That's for? just the lab. So over a 10 minute period, you collected a volume of 0.5 liters of flow rate. In the lab? Yeah, yeah at constant pressure. So yeah. it's nothing, the flow rate we know is not going to be constant. Uh, the, the, vol the volume that we collect at the end is simply a half a liter. Okay, so that's what we know from our lab experiments. What do we know then from our place and frame filter press? We know delta P is 300,000 pascals. We know area. Area is one meter square. <laughs> Um, we know LC, or we know the potential LC. Okay. So, so 40 millimeters voyage. You know the time of the batch. The time of the batch is 15 minutes. And then you know that it's the same slurry. It's the same slurry. So this gets you a far way on. Even if you just write this down, you're, you're showing your thought process. So we've defined our problem. <laughs> we've defined our goal. Yeah. And we know that we're, we're constant delta P filtration. Okay, so you've identified where you're going to look forward. But isn't part of the press constant rate not constant? Okay, so isn't part of the press constant rate? <coughs> yes, no. Can have both. It can have both. It is, but it's only a few seconds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 15 sec, uh, 15 minutes and a few seconds. So that volume of filtrate you collect in those first few seconds, it's it's the same problem we looked at in class. That initial period of time where you're at constant rate, or let's say you're not at constant pressure yet, is disregarded. It's a few seconds of, of, of operation. Okay, so we, we looked at that example in class and said last time, when we compared times, remember we said there's a few seconds due to constant rate and then the bulk of your time is due to constant pressure. But doesn't it ask for the total amount of filtration during each batch, and aren't the batches the 15 seconds and then 15 minutes? No, there's nothing about 15 seconds. Um, it says, like, the final question is, what is the total amount of filtrate being the press in each batch? Batch, yeah. Okay, so what is each batch <coughs> referring to? <coughs> 15 minutes, right? Does that make sense? No? No? Yeah. It does? No? I feel like it's confusing because I thought it meant, like, in each yeah, that's right. Okay. So when we looked at plate and frame filter presses, uh, and uh, Claudia showed us their operation, and, and she showed that video, it was very clear we fill up, and then clean out the cake, deposit it out, and if that's one cycle of the batch. So we we, do, we can refer to terms like the, the batch cycle time or cycle time as very much a batch-wise operation. You fill, empty out, clean. Fill, empty out, clean. Okay. So batch here refers to, that, that's why I, I emphasize plate and frame filter press. And if we go look back in our notes, um, even if it's not immediately apparent to you, filtration, filtration, of course, is here. Yeah. 
So if we go look back here at the notes, if we look at some of these units, how they, the, how they appear, there's a plate and frame filter press. We fill, up, fill that up and then open it up, clean it out. And then Claudia showed a smaller one here. This is in a, beer, a brewery. It's very clear that solids are accumulating in here. And then at some point in time, we're going to have to stop, open it up, and that goes to the batch. Okay, so after the 15 minutes of time that we choose to, to keep this closed for, and then open it up at the end. Okay, so we went through a, a case study in the, in the, in the notes on that. So we've got this information now of the two, two modes of operation. We're interested in calculating the volume here from the press. There's no reason actually to calculate the volume from the lab because we're given it. Okay, so even if you did add the two up, you've already been given that point five, and if you added it to that, you still needed to do the work to calculate that, and that's what we're, we're off. So you'd still get maybe just a single grade loss just for that if you just summed up those two volumes. So it wouldn't be a big deal at all if you misinterpret the question in that way. But we're, we're human, we understand how people think and that we don't always get to and express ourselves clearly and understand each other's words. So the next step then is we've defined, we've explored, and what is the, our strategy, our plan for solving this? What was your plan for solving it? And tell your neighbor what your plan was for solving it and exchange your approaches. So here it is, T is equal to BV plus KPV squared over 2. Drop that term off now. What's the next step in the plan? 
The KP term has the viscosity and the concentration of the slurry, and those will remain constant from your lab experiment to your like uh, your plate frame. Okay. Um, so you can solve those, but then there's that alpha thing that yeah. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's take a look. We've got mu C S alpha A squared delta P again. So what's it? What's my plan here? I've got T okay, for my lab. Yeah. I was just going to say you can equate the two times, like the two equations for two equations for each case. Okay. So you equate the two. Okay, so by equating then, you're saying that there's, like the ratio. there's equivalence yeah. between them, okay? So I've got the time here from the lab. I've got V from the lab. I can solve this for KP. Okay, so solve for KP. But Kp is equal to mu Cs alpha times area squared delta P. So this is from our lab step. Okay, so let's emphasize this. This is from the lab. Now, do we have everything there to solve? We know Kp, we know A, we know delta P. So I don't, the only things I don't know are all the three numerator terms. I don't know mu, C, S, and alpha. But I can maybe assume a mu for the viscosity, and there's still C, S, and alpha. It doesn't matter if I know them or don't know them. Just think about it for a minute. It doesn't matter. What does Kp mean? Kp, this term here, but this blue term originally derived from up here. Take a look all the way back into your notes. Where did that blue term propagate from? Okay. RC. RC. Okay, so it's a property of the cake and the properties of the solid and the slurry. So we're doing a lab experiment for what reason? Why do we do lab experiments? So we can calculate these properties, right? That was, and we saw that here in the notes. In that example here, we looked at this uh, picture, we did this lab experiment, we calculated these resistances, and then a few slides later, we reused those resistances to calculate this example continued, and we continued on with the plate and frame filter press. And so we did exactly this, this the same thing in the notes, except in the notes, our objective was to calculate the area required. This time, we're given the area of the plate and frame filter press, and we're required to calculate the volume. Okay, so it's simple. Uh, exchange of, of concept. There. But the critical thinking I want you to have is not just here's an equation I can plug in, but let's think what's what the numbers mean right, and, and where they come from. This is the RM term over here. It's related to RM, so it's describing the properties of the cake. It's this, we're dealing with the same cake in the lab as in the filter press. So we can bring legitimately over the mu CS and alpha from the lab experiment carry over to the plate and frame on the larger scale. So if we come now then to the plate and frame press, what equations will you be used for the plate and frame for the press? Same equation, T equals BV plus KP B squared over 2. Okay, so again, assume the membrane, sorry, the medium's resistance is negligible, so the medium disappears. The T, we have 15 minutes. The volume is what we're trying to solve for. This is my search variable. And here's KP. But KP in the plate and frame filter press is not the same KP as from the lab. So KP from the lab, is equal to mu C S L alpha divided by the area squared minus delta P. Okay, and then here we've got KP from the press is mu C S alpha area squared minus delta P. They're not the same KPs because those two denominator terms are different. Right? For the lab, I used a smaller area and a different delta P. For the press, I used a larger area and a higher delta P. Mu is the same. CS is the same, same slurry. 
the only thing is now this problematic alpha. Okay. So what do we do about alpha? Okay, so if you don't, if you assume cake is incompressible, what that means we said recall alpha is equal to some original alpha naught times delta p raised to the power f. So what is the incompressible cake assumption saying? F is equal to zero. Okay. So that's that's that assumption. Right? Now, if the cake were not incompressible and we go operate at a higher pressure, what's going to happen here to alpha? So let's say f is, what numbers do f take on? Between 0 and 1. Okay, so this is a positive value over here. We raise it to the exponent of, let's say, 0.5. So we're going to raise it to the square root of the, the, the new pressure drop and multiply by alpha naught to get alpha. And so alpha is going to be modified and go larger. We can calculate. So if, if delta p, if we assume even if you even if you got stuck at this point and said there's a I, I can't proceed because I don't know the pressure dependence of alpha, you can still go ahead and pick a value for f at zero and at the extreme of one and presents two answers and say, for incompressible cake, I can go use the same alpha, just carry it over. But if you said, well, I'm really stuck and I don't have no knowledge here, well, go and so just put in a value of f equals one, raise it to that power, alpha naught is from your lab experiment and you get your new alpha and it's gonna just double or make this twice as large or three times larger. So it's gonna increase it by some ratio. So you, you have options, right, when we're given incomplete information. You can, it just means your, your, your approach either then goes to the assumption of incompressible, or you diverge and present a solution where you assume compressible. Or you simply say, well, look, I'm not given this, and then work symbolically from this way, this way onwards. Right? But you, we don't just throw up our hands and say, well, we stop here because we can't solve it. Right. We, 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 we're engineers, we're trying to solve the problem, and we can. Right? We're given, we've got the tools, we can do it. Right? And we have the time to do it as well. So this is my key point from going through this. Is these are tough problems to deal with. We're not going to see every single solution to every problem in this course. Right? That's not our aim here. Right? We're not here at Mac to learn if presented problem A, I solve it with this method. If presented with problem B, I solve it with that method. If that were the case, um, then, like I said in yesterday's class, we'd be replaced by computers. Right? We need to use our, our main our heads to sort through this logic. So even at this point, a logical assumption might be to say the cake is incompressible and proceed. And then you've got all that information to finish up the problem, because now you can go calculate you simply take this new CS alpha numerator over here and sub it in over there, calculate KP, and from KP you can calculate your volume P. Okay. So it's solvable with that assumption. If the assumption, if you choose to go down this path and you either work symbolic or you assume a value for F, you can keep going. It's still solved. Yes, sir. It's the best assumption you've got at that time, right? It's not, look, look, these courses, I'm not about grading, as you've noticed, right? I'm not about grading, I'm about thinking, right? So I, it really, really sucks that our whole undergraduate system is so grade motivated. We're like dogs and food, right? You, you put food, pet food out and your dogs go crazy for it, right? That's the only thing that motivates them. Right, and we, we find that with students, and it's so unfortunate. Right? I want you to actually, my course is engage your mind. That's what I want you to take from this. So 
if we get stuck like this, look what we've done. We've followed a logical plan. Okay. Anyone who really got stuck with this problem, guaranteed if I go look at their solution, it's just going to be numbers and equations and I'm going to try this and I'm going to try that and something might work at the end and the instructor might give me a grade at the end. But I, not, I don't really care for that. If you've gone and worked through a systematic approach, it shows that you've engaged with the material and thought about it. That's, it's possible, right? It's not hard. We've got the six step plan that we've been using in the course to do that. Okay. So we've, we've gone up to step three, which is to plan. Step four is to solve. Step five is to check your answer. So what would you do there for checking? Just to see if your value makes sense, essentially. Are you, is it smaller than your lab test and it's quite or wrong? Right. So if it's, you know, absolute ginormous, then it's Right, so I was looking through some people's solutions yesterday and their volumes were smaller than the lab results. So they got a volume less than half a liter. That got immediately, you're going to say, look, I made a calculation error. Admit it in your, in your answer, there's something wrong here. Or you get a volume of 1,500 liters cubed. That's also not feasible in that time frame. Okay? So that's what checking is about, is to see that your answer makes, makes some sort of sense. So this question is, is perhaps deceptively simple in terms of the, the length of it. It's like a short paragraph, but it is doable. I, I, what I'm hoping to convey to you is that it's feasible. Yes? Um, I might miss this, but why can you see that RM is different from the other ones? Okay, why can you assume RM is small? In the lab, it shows that you have a 30 millimeter cake, and that's a really thick cake. So, relatively sized, like your membrane may always be like a millimeter or less a day. So, relatively, the resistance is pretty small. Okay. So, it's, it, if you we're not given any information to compute the the medium's resistance, right? The, how did we calculate the medium's resistance in this question? We found it, the medium resistance here. What's different between this question and the, the question in the, in the midterm? We were given um, filtrate volumes over various time periods, so we were able to plot it and right. then use that slope to calculate the uh, medium resistance. Oh, so the slope gets you the, the uh, cake resistance and the oh, intercept sorry. gets yeah. you the medium resistance, yeah. right? But the key here, you're given a wealth of information, you're given five data points. So you can now project back and calculate what that intercept is. With the midterm, you're only given a single data point. So the best you can do is calculate one value, the cake resistance. And with the assumption that Jeff mentioned that the 30 millimeters is, is a substantial cake thickness, that's going to probably present the most resistance to you. So it's a reasonable assumption to make. Plate and frame filter presses as well, very, very reasonable assumption to make. But the cake that's surprising is the resistance. <laughs> Right, and we know that as well because we've said, seen that, that the constant rate filtration is for a very short time. It's constant pressure there. Anything else about this question? A little bit of a challenge, but I, I really want you to take away from this that this is doable, right? We're, we're not faced with impossible problems here. It's just step back and let's think about it. And it really hurts a lot of people to do this because you've been trained in first year, well in high school, first year, second year, third year, that I can plug into an equation and get an answer. Right? Every single one of your courses, unfortunately, is structured that way, that you don't have to think. And it's a pity. So if any one instructor at Mac doesn't work that way, it's me. And that's one thing I want to convey to you. Okay, so that you can do this and think. About it. Let's take a look at question five, which is another thinking question. Okay, so take a minute and, and talk with their neighbor next to you, or if you don't have a neighbor next to you, write on a piece of paper what your plan is for this. Sorry, maybe before I get there, because that's so, still premature. I want you to focus on this step. What's going on in this question? Draw a picture, write what you know, what you don't know, and write out what your goal is. What's my aim? Explore the thing, and what's my unknown? Yeah. <laughs> 
is going to follow that same pattern provided it has the same density. Okay. What is a particle's trajectory going to be which has density larger or greater than that particle? More steeply. Yeah. So it's going to go off here. So a less dense particle will take a, an arc that's, that's like longer. Okay. So you've got all these potential arcs depending on the density difference. Okay. So that's my flow pattern in the, in the centrifuge. So this is going to be rho high and this is going to be rho, rho low. That's particle. So we know we're dealing with centrifuges, and we know that we've got these trajectories. Anything else we need to think about what's going on here? Because what's, uh, what's a constraint? What's like already fixed? OK, what's constrained? What's fixed? So we're going to write it out with the knowns and unknowns. So we've got some unknowns we're looking for, and we've got certain values that we must obey. Let's take a look at what, when we're talking about centrifuges, what equations would apply here. So part of the exploration is to see what tools we're going to use. So, oh, yes, go for it, sorry. So it's equal to sigma times sigma. Okay, so Q is equal to sigma times V. Now I've deliberately left off a lot there. What subscripts do we use? So total setting velocity and gravity. Anything else? Q cut. Q cut. What is Q cut? The flow rate that um, will allow the particle to swim at that halfway point. Okay, so here's R1. Okay, so there's the solid line over here, that's the barrier. And Q cut is the the feed volumetric flow rate that will cause this arc to land exactly 50% of the way between R1 and R2. Okay. So that solving for a Q-cut is going to say for a given particle with a given density, the density term appears in that, in that value over there. Sigma is only a function of the centrifuge. Q cut is going to cause that particle to start there and end over there. So that's my exploration. Now what do I what don't I know of there? What, what am I what's unknown? Obviously Q, Q is an unknown. Anything else? Uh, the dimensions of your centrifuge, so like height and your R1 and R2. Okay, so dimensions. Anything else? Your, like your height and your R2. Okay. Anything else we don't know we might need to use? So let's take a look at BTSV. BTSV under gravity is equal to the particle diameter squared times G times the density difference of the particle minus the density difference of the fluid we're in. Divided by the viscosity of the fluid times 18. So anything there we don't know? No. Okay. So So we know everything there. We can go calculate the density uh, difference, multiply here by GDP squared over 18 US. Get the total setting velocity. So I'm, I'm heading to my planning step. So I can easily get this value. Go plug it in over there, multiply it by sigma, and to get a Q. What's my sigma? But um, the BTSV question, do we do it twice for H? Okay, so we can do it for the for row H and we can go do it for row L. For the heavier particle and for the lighter particle. So we can do it twice. Okay. We're going to get to that question next. Which one do we use? Let's just quickly address the sigma term. What do I use for sigma? It's equal to that value there, so 1.49 times 10 to the minus 3. Omega squared, what is omega? And that. Uh, <coughs> variable. Which one's your Omega values? Depends what you want it to be. Depends what you want it to be. Pick the highest one. Why do we pick the highest one? 
If you picked a lower one, you're going to get a smaller Q-cut. So you want the maximum Q-cut, highest volumetric feed rate possible. So omega must be maxed out. What is the omega that's maximum? We need to convert to radians per second to SI units. Okay? Okay, so we have 9.55 is the conversion from RPM to radians per second. Okay, so we're going to sum it over there and get our signal. How bad if you use the wrong units? So it's going to be off by a factor of two orders of magnitude. And you're going to, so 10 squared. You're going to be very wrong. <laughs> okay. So again, like I said, this course isn't about numbers. This course is about thinking and solving. And if you presented this to your manager, your manager will say, look, you screwed up. Go fix it up. And you present the right answer. That's not a big To me, is that you've actually thought of the right approach. So we've got a sigma now. The only question remaining is which TSD do we use? Do we use the heavier one or the lighter one? Why? You know? Okay. So he's going to think about it. Why would you use the heavier one? Uh, you know that like, the heavier particles are going to be thrown against the inside of the people, so the lighter particle will hopefully be used. Um, okay, so if we go and calculate Q-cut, for the heavier particle, it says the heavier particle follows this trajectory. What trajectory is the lighter particle going to follow? The one to the left or the right? The right. Okay, and it's going to get taken out into the overflow. So we only need to calculate the TSV for the heavier of the two, and the lighter particle will go away. So, key learning here. If you go and just use this equation from the notes, without thinking what it's doing and what it's telling you, then you're not going to be able to answer this problem. This problem rests on your, your understanding of what this equation does. Being able to use it is easy, right? It's a simple multiplication of two values to get you an answer. Anyone can do that. But understanding what it's doing is key to solving this. Let's take a look quickly at part two. If you're not satisfied with that Q, what are you going to do to double it? What can you do? Here's Q. What can you do to increase it? Can you change the liquid? Can I change the liquid? Okay, firstly, can we change sigma? No, sigma is out of the question because we already at our maximum. So what can we change about our liquid? You could part the viscosity. Anything else you can practically do? Is that practical? Find another liquid. Yeah, I think it's cool. Yeah, like if you could find like an oil, like another liquid that was going to be that lower. Okay. Well, what if you just use the same water, row F, and heat it? Yeah. Okay. How much do you have to heat it? It was too high. That's why I said another liquid because okay. it would be too much. So take a look at what temperature. You don't have to know this obviously, but out of interest, you should know what temperature you should heat water up to. So if you get this glass, it's hot. You like the particles. Flocculate the particles. What's that going to do? Increase DP. Increase DP. Can flocculation be so carefully controlled to double? Because you have to go and yeah. take us to the square root of two, right? Probably not. Anything else we can practically do? Sorry, if you flocculate though, how can we make sure to flocculate only one of the That's right. If you can flocculate, how are you only going to flocculate one of the particles? That's a fair point. They have different properties. Okay, choose a flocculant. Okay, so flocculant is not a practical one, probably, because you cannot carefully control flocculation. But it, one of the easiest ones you can adjust is rho, rho L minus, just a second, rho L minus rho F. The density difference currently is 250 units, 125 or minus 1,000. So choose a fluid that gets your density difference that's double that. So make sure your delta rho is 500. You don't go halve your, your density for a fluid. You simply make sure that that delta is because sigma is a function of the centrifuge. The centrifuge R1, R2, and H are fixed. Omega is already at its maximum. Okay, so that's the